All right, so let me just tell you, this is the basic thing, this is the basic takeaway that our children, our youth, and all adults of all ages should be able to get. I'm going to start off with this. But you're going to need to work with the sermon notes and fill in the blank here. Uh, I hope we have the screen working. Is the screen working? Are we good? Good. People who are, what goes in that? What goes in that blank? People who are something of themselves cannot be, again, another blank, God's spirit. How are we going to fill in those blanks? Well, it's pretty simple. You ready to go? People who are full of themselves. If we are full of ourselves, it's all about us, all about my stuff, my family, my thing, my likes. If I am full of myself, people who are full of themselves cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Got no room for God. Do you have room for God? Are you open to God? People who are full of themselves cannot be filled with God's spirit. Empty yourself is today's sermon. It's a title, and it's also a command and a calling from the Lord himself. Empty yourself. We're going to see this over and over again as we continue to work through Jesus' teaching to us about what it means to be his disciples, what it means to be Christians. If we're full of anger and grudges, we're not going to be open to forgive others and to receive God's grace and forgiveness. I mean, it's going to keep running all the way through the story. If I'm hanging on to my stuff, you know, people who don't graciously give to God and his mission, it astounds me. People who don't tithe, who don't give graciously. It's obvious I'm holding on to stuff, so I, I've got a little bit of room for God, maybe in a few slivers here or there, if I really need his help, but I am not born anew in his Holy Spirit. If I'm full of myself, if I'm already packed in. Now today we're going to be coming to the Lord's table and we're going to be coming to the Lord, the Savior, who totally emptied himself that you might be saved. The one who's going to say to us, this is my body given for you. <laughs> If we're going to come to him with any integrity, we are called to be new people, people who are open. So children, youth, adults, if I'm full of myself, if it's all about me, I have no room for God. But conversely, if I empty myself before God and open my heart and my hands and let go, that God might fill me with his grace, then there is salvation. So as we prepare to come to the Lord's table today, I want to invite you to call upon this prayer. And it's a prayer that we, you know, I would encourage you to include every day of your life. Again, this is family devotional type prayer from the close of David's Psalm 139. David says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me to the core of who I am, God. And if I'm hanging on to stuff, if it's really about me instead of about you, cleanse it, make me new. Drive away what is getting in the way of my relationship with you that I might truly empty myself before you. Today we're going to be turning to Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. But first we're going to read some passages from Isaiah that help us understand the ongoing story of Scripture and the prophecies upon which Jesus is calling, really wrapping up so much from the Old Testament as he brings before us his teaching to his disciples. So first we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 29, verses 17 through 19. And there the Lord says, Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon? Lebanon is, you know, Phoenicia, seacoast, which includes Tyre and Sidon, just to remind you of this. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field? And the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? 
in that day, the deaf, the Lord says, shall hear the words of a book. And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. And then to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, Jesus reads the first three quarters of this passage in his central sermon that we learned about from Luke chapter 4, his inaugural statement of his messianic mission. Here it is, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and all the way through the fullness of verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then verse 3 as well, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of faint, a faint spirit, so that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And then finally to Isaiah chapter 66, the second part of verse 2 and then verse 5. The Lord, again, this is the Lord speaking directly. But this is the one to whom I will look. The one who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. In verse 5, hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. But it is they who shall be put to shame. Now, to Jesus, in Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 17, and he, this is Jesus, came down with them and stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and a large multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd was seeking to touch him for power was coming forth from him and healing them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are the hungry now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who are the weeping now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people will hate you, exclude you, revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, because so their fathers treated the prophets the same. Yet woe to you who are rich, for you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, because so their fathers treated the false prophets the same. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. People who are full of themselves cannot be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Empty yourself. Not sure where to start? Well, we can start with the good news revolution that Jesus is and has announced in his coming. He is announcing it as we read our way through Luke, and he has now announced it. It is before us. The New Testament revolution. 
As I was talking with some of our covenant class members, I realized I need to remind us on a regular basis, New Testament is the same as New Covenant. We are New Covenant people. The New Covenant prophesied in the Old Testament through obviously Jeremiah, but also Isaiah, Ezekiel, and really running all the way through, all the way back to Deuteronomy, the New Covenant. So we are people of the New Covenant, the New Testament, which is not just a descriptor of 27 books at the close of the Bible, but our entire way of being in relationship with God. This New Testament, this New Covenant revolution leads to the great kingdom reversal. A lot of times you hear people call this the upside down kingdom of God. It is a great reversal. Tables are turned. What the world thinks is upside down is actually right side up. Let me repeat that. What the world thinks is upside down is actually right side up and God will justify the right side. Leon Morris in his commentary on Luke says that Jesus and the Beatitudes and woes make a mockery of the world's values. The Beatitudes exalt what the world despises and rejects what the world admires. So you have to decide, are you going to see the world and your life the way most social media, most TV, most advertising directs you to? By the way, for that matter, most politics directs you to? Are you going to see the world that way or Jesus' way? The New Testament, the New Covenant Revolution. So Jesus, he came down. I'm going to point this out to you. We'll keep moving. But notice there's three or you could say even four categories of folks addressed here at the beginning of our passage from Luke. He, this is Jesus, came down with, what goes in the blank there? Number one, it's directly from the scripture, them. But that begs the question, who is them, right? What's the antecedent there? He came down with them and stood on a level place. Well, he's coming down with the apostles, the 12 that he has just chosen. That's the previous verses, okay? He, among all his larger group of disciples, Jesus calls and names 12 as apostles. So he's coming down with the apostles and clearly with the larger group of disciples from whom he chose the 12 apostles. But the 12 apostles, and this means, by the way, just to remind you, this means all the way from Simon Peter and John and James all the way through Simon the Zealot and, yes, Judas Iscariot. Interesting group of the 12, right? So Jesus comes down with them and he stands on a level place. This message is not the Sermon on the Mount. Luke is not confused. He's not giving us an abbreviated version of the Sermon on the Mount. This is a separate occasion with separate teaching. Okay? This is a separate occasion with separate teaching, some of which overlaps with the Sermon on the Mount, but it's quite distinct in many ways. So Jesus comes down to a level place, the indication is he's down near or by the seashore. He's down at the common people's level. He's been up on the mountain all night praying. Then he comes down to mid-range. He chooses and names the 12 apostles. And now he's coming all the way down to a level place. So he comes down with them, the apostles and, and some other disciples, and with a large crowd. So not just a few disciples, but with a large crowd of his the scripture tells us this, his disciples. So you got them, the apostles, and maybe a few other key core disciples. And then you got this large crowd of disciples. That's number two. And number three, a large multitude of people from where? From all Judea and Jerusalem. So this is not just Galilean folks. They're coming up from all Judea as well as all parts and classes of Jerusalem. And notice this, the large multitude also includes people from where? The seacoast of what? Palestine? No. Lebanon. Tyre and Sidon. You remember Sidon, right? Jezebel's from Sidon, but also the widow whom 
Elijah is so good to. So, you know, we got all these Gentiles coming. The point is we've got international folks coming to Jesus. Luke makes this very clear to us. It's not just Jews. It's Gentiles too. Hordes of them coming from pagan Gentile areas now to hear Jesus and to be healed by him. Um, Mark tells us the same thing. People are coming, Mark chapter 3, verse 8. People are coming from Tyre and Sidon and that, that region. And as Isaiah prophesied, is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field? Now, let's look at what's happening here. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, we have Moses's, through God's revelation, Moses delivering Torah, instruction or law, for the people of Israel, God's people. And in my Sunday school class right now, we're studying Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, you get this over and over again, blessings, blessings and curses, blessings and curses. So, in, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 28, see, I am setting before you today a blessing, a blessing, Barakah and a curse, kalalal, okay? The blessing, if you obey it. Did you hear that? And, and it literally means if you hear and heed, okay? Shema language there. If you obey it, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and curse if you do not hear and heed, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. So in other words, the law under Moses, you're going to be blessed if you hear and obey God's instructions and commandments, and you're going to be cursed if you do not hear and obey God's commandments. What about the New Testament? The New Testament is radically different. Let me repeat that. The New Testament is radically different. Now we have Jesus coming down from the mountain, having named his 12 apostles, indicating he is forming a new or renewed Israel. That's why there's 12. This is a new covenant people. This is a new covenant Israel with the 12 who will ultimately judge the 12 tribes of Israel and have authority over. This is bigger and you know, far beyond Israel, per se, in the Old Testament. In this, Jesus now, his didache, his instruction for the new Israel, for the kingdom people, includes, at the beginning, beatitudes and woes. Now, I talk about blessings and curses under Torah. Well, what's the difference here? Let's look at this. And he lifted up his eyes on whom? The large crowds from Tyre and Sidon? No, of course he sees them. But specifically, what's, what goes in the blank there? He lifted up his eyes on his disciples. This is a message to people who would follow Jesus. Are you a Christian? This is a message for you. This is not your first evangelistic tool to somebody who's not a believer. This is inside conversation to his disciples. And said, blessed, the Greek makario, Makarios, Makario. Blessed are you who are the poor. He's talking to his disciples. Blessed are you. Now, let me make clear. This language that we're reading in the New Testament is a language of blessing that is not achieved or acquired by performance or possessions. The Beatitudes are Jesus's declaration. He is declaring this as the son of man who will come again to judge the living and the dead. He is the judge of all the earth and he is declaring this as a done deal. The faithful are justified. We talk about justification by faith. You've heard of that a lot in the Reformed Protestant background, right? Well, here Jesus is saying Faith is justified. This is talking about the justification of faith, which leads to our justification by faith. Let me repeat that. Jesus justifies faithfulness. 
which leads to our justification by faith. This is the justification of faith. Jesus declares the faithful are justified and blessed, period, in stop. The Greek term, the Greek term that is used a lot of times, uh, eulogeo, eulogeo, you know, you know it from eulogy, right? It, it means to invoke or uh, to ask for blessings or to cast praises, like to bless God with praises. It comes, the, the, uh, the Hebrew is barakah, okay? This is different language here. With Jesus' beatitudes, it's different language. In the Old Testament, there's a totally different term and word cluster that's ashray. Um, Jewish people pray ashray from the Psalms, but the idea is it is accomplished. It's already, the God is already the divine one with the ashray. And when you have the Beatitudes, for instance, in the Psalms, it's saying, blessed is the man who abides in God's word. It's happened, it's declared. Makarios, the language that's used in the Greek New Testament uh, translation of what Jesus is saying, is telling us this. Let me make this very clear again. Jesus, as the Son of Man, is declaring this. He is proclaiming judgment and grace with these beatitudes and these woes. He is declaring it. Blessed, joyful state is already given. In other words, you don't earn this. He is giving it to you in declaration as the Son of Man. That, that's what's happening here with these beatitudes and woes. And let me remind you, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, the woes aren't there. This is a different stage of Jesus' teaching. Some of you all have been studying the, the Gospel of Matthew. Remember, you've got beatitudes. You don't have the woes paired with them. Okay, you don't. You, don't. you have the antithesis statements off of the law, but that's a different discussion. Most of what you get in Matthew, the second half of Matthew 5 and 6, is not anywhere to be seen in this teaching because this is a very precise teaching, and Jesus is declaring the Beatitudes with the woes as he establishes new Israel here. Jesus, the Son of Man, proclaims this. You don't earn this. It's not like back in Deuteronomy. If you do right, then you will be blessed. If you do wrong, you will be cursed, Israel. No, no, no. Jesus is saying, if you are my disciple, if you're truly empty before me and believing in me, I'm declaring it and giving it to you now because I have that authority. This is New Testament stuff. This is New Covenant stuff. Jesus says in his inaugural sermon, you know, his central sermon in um, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, verse 21, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. It's done. He has begun to say to them, remember what Jesus says? Today, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. Blessed are you, disciples, who are the poor. Yours is the kingdom of God. And then the paired warning, woe to you, disciples. Remember now, he's talking to disciples. Woe to you, disciples, who are rich. You're receiving your comfort here on earth. You're not empty before me. You're not really in me. Now let me clarify this. Jesus is not blessing and calling good poverty and hunger in the abstract. He's not saying that. He's not saying that grieving is great, good, wonderful, what a blessing. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. Nor is he saying that all poor people are blessed in his presence. Again, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's talking to you. And he's saying when you in faith become the poor for the sake of the kingdom, I declare it already, you're blessed. Isaiah 29, 19. The meek, the humble, shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor, the vulnerable, the needy, shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. Let me, get, let me just make this clear. Jesus is addressing his disciples, and he declares, blessed any of you who in faithfulness empty yourself before him for the sake of the kingdom. You don't achieve blessedness through that. 
He says, you have done it in faith, the faith that I've given you, and I'm declaring it now, you're blessed. Jesus declares good news for the poor. Who, who, who are these, the poor, of Isaiah 61? Well, look at this from Isaiah 66. But this is the one to whom I will look, the Lord says. He who is humble or poor and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. In other words, not just randomly poor people. We're talking about people who believe in God and become poor because of their faithfulness to God. They're, they're following God instead of chasing after the baubles of the world. That's what the scripture is talking about. Blessed are you, Jesus says, who are the hungry. You'll be fed. You'll eat the great feast. But woe to you, disciples, who would call yourself my follower, who are full now. You shall be hungry. And Jesus is not calling us to fast, you know, the rest of our lives. This is a calling of spiritual emptiness before him. Blessed are you who are the weeping. You'll be comforted. Woe to you who laugh now. You'll mourn and weep, disciples who are laughing now. Blessed are you when you're hated, when you're excluded, when you're reviled on account of what? I really want you to catch this. He could have said me, but what goes in that blank? What goes in that blank? What does Jesus say? On account of the Son of Man. The Son of Man, Allah, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, who comes as God on earth, as the judge. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. <coughs> Jesus says, when you align yourself with me as the true judge, as the true king, and you're reviled because of it, because the world says, he's not real, or we've got the answers, or we've got the new standards. When you're reviled because you stand with me, Jesus says, as I am, as the authoritative king and son of man, who will come again to judge all the living and the dead, you will be and you are justified in my presence. But if you do not stand with me, if you do not stand with me as the son of man, oh yeah, the crowd right now will think you're great because you're, you're moving with the times, baby. But Jesus says, it is not gonna go well in eternity for you. That's the way they treated the false prophets. When the false prophets, false prophets said, everything's fine, don't worry about it. God loves us. Knock yourself out. Be greedy. Be sexually immoral. Who cares? Just do the right kind of rituals and everything's okay. No, no, Jesus says, no, no, no. It's not like that. If you stand with me as the son of man, you are and will be justified forever. But woe to you who chase after the opinions of other people. Isaiah 65, excuse me, 66, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for not my name's sake have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. But it is they who shall be put to shame. Directly connected with Jesus' beatitude and woe. <coughs> so what do we do? What should we do as we prepare to come to the Lord's table today? James chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 teaches us to do what? What should we do with ourselves in God's sight? What goes in that blank there? Humble. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He, He will lift you up. He will <coughs> lift you up. Humble yourself. Empty yourself. But remember this the blessing is not grasped or achieved by you out of your righteousness. It's a gift. Remember 1 Corinthians 13? If I do all these things, but I don't have love, a love which comes from God that transforms my heart, it is nothing. 
right? I can move mountains. It's nothing if I don't have love, the love that comes from God. So we must empty ourselves to open our hearts to the love and the spirit of God. The blessing is not achieved or acquired by performance. So how do we do this? Well, we need to look to Jesus. We're going to be looking to Jesus as we come to his table. Let's remember the path that he makes for us, the way that he makes for us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. In humility, regard one another as what? What does Philippians 2, verse 3 say? In humility, regard one another as more important than yourself. Man, that is turning the world upside down, isn't it? I regard other Christians as more important than moi. It's not about me. It's about emptying myself. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but what did Jesus do? This is Philippians 2 verse 6. What did he do? He emptied himself. He emptied himself. Taking a servant's form. Taking a servant's form. Let me just read you this. This is so powerful. Philippians chapter 2. who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but, verse 7, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant or a bond slave, um, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is humility and obedience. This is what Jesus teaches us, humility and obedience. The pre-existent Son of God did not, let me make this clear, empty himself of his divinity but instead, because of his divinity, because of who he is as God, who is love, he gave himself away for your salvation. He put aside, he set aside all of his prerogatives that you might be saved. This is what this Christ hymn, this Christ creed is talking about that Paul gives us in Philippians chapter 2. The incredible gospel is that his humility and obedience are not in conflict with his divinity, but in fact flow from it. Let me repeat this. His humility and obedience flow from the fact that he is the Son of God. And people who belong to the Son of God will follow him in this. Dr. Charlie Moore puts it this way. The pre-existent Son of God regarded equality with God not as excusing him from the task of redemptive suffering and death, but actually as uniquely qualifying Jesus for this vocation. Being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. He emptied himself, and he's inviting you to empty yourself, to receive and to be filled by him and his grace and his spirit alone. This, he says, is my body given for you. This, this, the new covenant, the new testament, in my blood shed for you. 
let us prepare to come in truth to Jesus, empty of ourselves, filled by him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.